We'll be reading from verse 10 until verse 18. Okay. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by our father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all, for he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God had mercy on whom he, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Well, for those that have um, sort of um, almost rejoined the congregation um, for the first time since the summer this morning, you've, you've come into um, us restarting the series on Romans, and you've come into possibly one of the two most difficult chapters in Romans. <laughs> so um, we, we mentioned this um, last week. We're, we're looking at Romans 9 to 12, um, this term, and, and Romans 9 is uh, one to get our minds around, and, and Romans 11 um, is also a little bit tricky. Romans 10 is a wonderful um, chapter in between. Um, they're all wonderful, but they're, they're just going to be a slightly hard work for the next um, sort of 20 minutes or so. Um, we, we did, in, in a sense, com completely changed our service last week um, to respond, obviously, to, to the death of the Queen. And after our, um, this, this um, look at Romans 9, we will pause um, again, for a time of prayer and a time of, of quiet and, and to reflect and so on um, ahead of, of tomorrow. Um, some of the events uh, in recent days and in days to come will involve kind of making pledges and promises. Uh, the new king will have to do that, won't he? He's done it already, but he'll have to do that in, in, a, in a much more formal um, kind of setting um, and I guess promises and, and pledges uh, are things that we, we make at various times. I was never a cub or a scout or a guide, of course. Um, but I think they make kind of promises, don't they? Did you, anybody in those sort of groups or were in those groups when you make promises when, when you start and, and make pledges and so on? When you join a club, in a sense, that happens, doesn't it? You know, there are certain rules and regulations in the club that you, you were going to abide by. It's that, that sort of thing. Um, and of course, the politicians recently have been pledging allegiance again to the king and making those sort of promises. Um, I say all of that because the, the issue that Romans 9 began with two weeks ago when we were in it really was this sort of looming question of whether God has broken his pledge or broken his promise. That's the sort of issue that, that Romans 9 starts with. And what that's referring back to, and this is where, you know, one of the reasons these chapters are a little bit more difficult is that we, we may not know the detail of the Old Testament so well, so we, so we have to sort of place a bit of catch up. But what's in view is that in Genesis 12, with a world that's been created at the beginning of Genesis and then fallen into sin and, and judgment and the effect of human sin and death coming and people setting themselves up against God in, in Genesis 11, God then sort of enters, if, as it were, into the story of his humanity and he calls Abraham, key, key moment. And he, out of the blue, as far as Abraham's concerned, God sort of interacts with him and says, I'm going to make your name great. And in a way, we can say tick, because here we are in 2022 talking about Abraham. I will make your name great. I will make you into a great nation. I will give you your own land. Blessing for the whole world will somehow come through you. Details unknown at that stage. And the implications when you build from Genesis 1 to 11 of this moment is that Eden 
is somehow going to be restored. The, the, the fall and what went wrong there is going to be put right. A worldwide impact, somehow through Abraham, as I say, we don't know how at that stage in the Bible. And salvation is going to come. Blessing is going to come. And so I think there may be a slide, actually, Dan. I don't know if you can pop the first one up. Um, the question that Romans 9 is, 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 begins with grappling with is essentially saying, well, where are Israel now? Where are they now? The majority, when Paul was writing the letter to the Romans, where did the majority of the Israelite nation stand now? What, what's going on? They're occupied by Roman forces. But more than that, they've, on the whole, rejected the Messiah. We've just sung, haven't we? Jerusalem, and, and the king has come, the Messiah has come, and, and Israel, as it were, as a, as a whole nation, have, have cried out for his death. Release Barabbas. Crucify the Messiah. And so when we come into Romans 9, the, the issue is, you know, have God's promises been kept? Is God dependable? And we said two weeks ago, the, the reason that's important is that persecution is coming big time for the church in Rome. The emperors are enjoying burning Christians alive or throwing them to the lions. And the big question for the church in Rome, as the heat literally is turned up on them, is, is God dependable? Does he keep his word? Does he keep his promises? And so that's, what, that's why he's grappling with this now in Romans 9. And the answer that we saw last time, two weeks ago, is that Paul is saying, absolutely God has kept his word. God's word has not failed, chapter 9, verse 6. And his explanation, I said, to, I said two weeks ago, I thought was, was quite complicated for us, to which somebody said on the way out, well, that seemed quite simple to me. So that was good. So somebody understood. But this, this, is, this is the answer that Paul gives as to why God has absolutely kept his word. And the explanation, and it's a lovely Venn diagram for you mathematicians among you here. I think it is anyway. Um, don't put this in your homework because there's probably wrong things on here. But the, the lighter blue is, is all of the nation of Israel, all of Abraham's descendants, according to verse 7. All of the children who are physically descended from Abraham. So that's the lighter area all around. And what Paul has argued is that there is an Israel within Israel. Verse 6, not all who are descended from Abraham or Israel, are Israel. There is an Israel within Israel. There are those that verse 7 describes as, God's, as, as Abraham's children, his true children, within the whole nation. So all are descended from Abraham, but some are viewed as Abraham's children. Some are referred to in verse 8 as God's children or children of the promise. And so Paul had sort of illustrated this, that, you know, Ishmael... Was, was not a child of the promise. Um, but, but sort of Isaac and Jacob um, are children of the promise. There are those that within the nation... Oh, it's a bit windy. Um, yeah, those that are within who are the true children of Abraham. And, and Paul is, is basically arguing that God has kept the promises that he made to his people, those that are within the nation. So that, that's the, the sort of first... Uh, issue that we've been looking at. Um, is God's word dependable? Has he kept his promises pledge? And Paul has said, absolutely, yes, he has. And that, that's the reason. Again, come and talk to me more uh, afterwards if you'd like to. I want to just move on this morning to ask as we, as we move into the next few verses, what is it that, that actually distinguishes those that are in that true people of God, if you like, within all of the descendants of Abraham? What is it that marks them as different? And there are a number of answers to this, but the book of Romans has given two, really. One of them is about faith, that Abraham's faith, the faith that Abraham had in God, those people have the same faith. That's something that connects those, the, the true children of Abraham, the true descendants, if you like, God's children. God made various promises to Abraham, and we're told Abraham believed God. And because of that faith, in, in line with that faith, God then credited righteousness to Abraham's account. Abraham believed God had faith and righteousness was given to them. And that's the same, absolutely true, of everybody in that circle. I'm going to do this rather than <laughs> fight. So everybody else 
Isaac, Jacob, all of those that are descended, the true children of God within Israel, have the same faith. They believe God's promises. They trust God in the same way. And righteousness has been credited to their account. The other thing that chapter 2 of Romans has said is that that there's a difference when it comes to the, the use of the idea of circumcision. So thinking of all the male Israelites, all the physical descendants of, of Abraham, they've all, all the males have been physically circumcised, an outward circumcision. But in Romans 2, Paul says that, that the true Jew, if you like, the true Israelite, Israelite the, the, the person, the real child of Abraham, has experienced what Paul refers to as a circumcision of the heart. That they, there's a, a mark, if you like, within their heart, the work of God's spirit within the heart. And, and Paul says that, in a sense, is the true Jew, not just simply one outwardly, but one who's experienced the work of God's spirit on their hearts. That was true of Abraham, and it was true of all the true, if you like, descendants of Abraham. And actually, it's true of every Christian here. This is the sort of continuity from the Old Testament into the New. Every true and genuine Christian has faith like Abraham's faith. We have believed God, and he has credited righteousness to our account, which is why the New Testament, interestingly, refers to the Christians as the children of Abraham. We are of Abraham. We're in that group there with Abraham and with Abraham's descendants. We have faith that saves and we've received righteousness. And in the same way, every Christian has experienced the circumcision of the heart. God's spirit has entered into you as a Christian and has done work within your heart, marked you as his adoption to sonship. So what distinguishes those that that are physical descendants but not uh, the, the people of God, if you like, is faith, is an internal work of God's spirit. And then verses 10 to 12, which which, have just been read to us, give us two more things that mark those, uh, as as it were, that belong to God. Let me just read them. Verse 10, not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by the same father, our father Isaac, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. And I think we've got another slide which sums up these two things that mark out, as it were, the Israel within Israel, the true people of God. Verses 10 to 12 say that these people have been chosen by God in accordance with his purposes, and they've been called to him. And none of that is based on their works. And it's illustrated by Jacob and Esau, who were twins in their mother's womb, before they'd been born, before they'd done anything good or bad, verse 11, God had a plan. He chose Jacob in accordance with his purpose, and he called Jacob to him. Now, for some of us, this idea of God choosing and calling may well be a brand new idea to us, maybe something we've not really come across or thought about before. For others of us here this morning, we're very familiar with this thing. Some of us will feel very comfortable with with the idea of God choosing Jacob and not Esau, and God who who chooses, a God who, who calls certain people, but not others. Some of us will feel comfortable with that. Some of us will feel a bit uncomfortable with that. Um, and in some ways, you can look at this this same event of Jacob and Esau from two different angles at the same time. So I was very pleased yesterday to receive an email um, from the, I don't know what they're called, the SRO audiences. I don't know if anybody's ever been to a programme and watched it being filmed and made. Um, Anybody? Yeah, yeah, good. We, we, we went to see Have I Got News For You, which was fun, uh, being filmed. But I got an email yesterday saying that we've got three tickets to go and watch Taskmaster. So I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> so that, anyway, don't worry if you haven't, but it's, uh, it's I think basically five celebrities that, that go out and do all sorts of different tasks and they award them points for it. But this is the filming of the thing in the studio that goes all around it. So I'm very pleased. Esther, um, who's away this weekend, sent her a little screenshot of the email, so she's thrilled as well. So anyway, anyway, to get sidetracked. Um, 
one of the things I love is actually seeing how these things are made, seeing all the different camera positions, seeing all the crew, you know, all dressed in black, sound people, the making of this sort of thing. And often, as we know, with, with whatever programme, there are camera angles that you can view things from. Um, again, an illustration would be the queue, wouldn't it, this week? The, there are cameras right up in front of people as, as the royals are meeting those in the queue. Then you've got an aerial thing of this massive thing along the Thames. Two different views, both right, both true, both existing at the same time. And you can do that with the Jacob and the Esau and God choosing it on a human level. You can chart their two lives. You can see that Esau, as the twin born first, the eldest, it was his birthright to, to, to be the firstborn and have his inheritance and so on. And from the camera, camera filming the sort of up close and personal sort of human view, Esau swaps his birthright for a bowl of soup. Sort of an insight into, into what happened with Esau. Swapping his birthright for a bowl of soup. Jacob becomes, as, as it were, treated as the firstborn, the one that will inherit, that inherits the promise and so on. Esau would go on to have children and be, become the nation of Edom, who would become great enemies of the people of God, a, a wicked nation. Jacob inherits that birthright as, as Esau sort of does the swap with him. Jacob is renamed Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob renamed Israel. And from Israel, from Jacob, then comes the entire nation of Israel, God's chosen people. From a human level, from that camera, that's what happened. But from the camera from above, from God's level, if you like, verses 10 and 11 says that Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by the same father Isaac, yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, they hadn't been born, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Both camera angles true. Jacob and Esau, responsible and accountable before God for what they do and their choices and their swaps and all the rest of it. But ultimately, God is over all and before either of them have been born, God chooses and God calls. And in the same way on the previous diagram that faith is, a quality, is true of those within Israel, if you like, the, the true Israel within Israel, faith is a quality and, and a circumcision of the heart is a quality that we share as Christians. The choosing and the calling of God is absolutely true of every Christian in this room as well. So let me take you back to Romans 8. And verse 28, and the first verse that we, many of us will know quite well. But listen here to the description of the Christian church, the, the, those that truly know and have trusted Jesus Christ. Paul says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Almost the same phrase as used there of Jacob. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. The amazing thing about Christian testimonies, and we had Maria, didn't we, last week? Yeah, it was last week, sharing her testimony, her journey to faith. The, the ingredients, the people involved, the decisions that she made, that's the camera at the human level. Romans says that God foreknew Maria. He predestined Maria. He called Maria. He justified Maria. He has even glorified her. Even though that event hasn't yet happened, it's as good as it's happened. God works for good, the good in of all things for those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. That's the other camera angle. He absolutely is the God who calls and chooses and justifies and so on. Now, if we go to the next slide, this is where Paul goes, because on the one hand, this is amazing stuff. If we'll only allow, you know, and ask God to help us to understand this and for it to sink in, that before, not only before Maria was born, 
or had done any good or, or bad or anything like that. God had a purpose to call her to himself. But before the world was created, he had that purpose. So it's astonishing, isn't it, if you're a Christian here this morning, to think that God already had in his mind that he would call you and choose you and draw you and adopt you and fill you and justify you and glorify you before you've done any good or bad. And yet it does lead to the question that Paul asks in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is God unjust to behave like that? Is there something unjust about God calling and choosing Jacob, but not Esau? Before Esau or Jacob were born, before they'd done anything good or bad, God had made a choice. Is that fair? Is the question that Paul raises, verse 14. Is God unjust? And throughout these two or three chapters, Paul follows the same pattern. He raises a question. He tells you the answer straight away, so you haven't got to hang around. Not like a sermon. You've got to wait around for 25 minutes for the point. He says, no, here's the question. Here's the answer. Now let me explain. That's the pattern he'll do several times in these chapters. So have a look at verse 14 again. What shall we say then? Is God unjust? Not at all. So there's the answer. Paul says God is not being unjust in behaving in this way. And then he brings the explanation. And he points us in verse 15 to words that God said to Moses. And I think we can probably put the final slide on if you want to see the answer before we fully get there. He points us to Moses in, in verse 15. In the context of that quote, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion is taken from God speaking to Moses again just after in Exodus 33, the, the creation of the golden calf. Moses is up the mountain with God. He's been a while. And so they get all their gold and silver together and melt it all down and so on and they make themselves a god the golden calf, and they begin to worship the golden calf, and they say, this is the God that brought us up out of Egypt, and so on. You should have no gods beside me, you should have no idols, first two commandments, and here they go now worshipping this false god. And the key thing for us to grasp, if we don't grasp this next sentence, we won't understand the full, the full thing. The key thing that we have to grasp at this point is that they are having done this, having broken these commandments and made this God and worshipped it and so on, they deserve to be punished for their sin. They deserve the justice of God. They've sinned greatly by worshipping another God, a God of their own creation. That should be the end of the story. And yet, God chooses to be merciful towards them. He chooses not to treat them as their sins deserve. I will have mercy, says God, on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And so Paul adds in verse 16, it doesn't therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. If God had simply acted in justice, remember that's our question, verse 14, if God had only acted in justice, he could have de destroyed them immediately. It would have been the just thing to do. But instead, he, he relents, he holds back, if you were his justice, and he says, I will have mercy, I will have compassion. And the same thing, then, if you take that example of Israel to Jacob and Esau, the same thing's actually true of them, strictly speaking. The moment they are born, the moment that either of them does any good or bad, the justice of God would mean that, 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 that judgment comes because of their sin. That the wrath of God that we sang about earlier on would, would come as a result of their sin. That's the just thing. That sin and wrongdoing, rejection of God, mistreatment of others, all of that deserve the judgment and the justice of God. Neither of them deserve any of the mercy of God or the compassion of God. They deserve his justice. And if we, let's imagine we're out there pro protesting with our big placards, I've drawn a nice one on my page here. We want justice. That's the question, isn't it? Has God been unjust? If we march about in Fish Street saying, we want justice, we want justice. Justice will be for Jacob and Esau, 
who are both deserving of God's wrath to, to be judged, to be condemned, to be dealt with. That's, the, that's justice. And if we say to, to God, you know, no, 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 we, we don't want this Jacob, not Esau business. We want justice. We are asking for him to condemn us. Because that's justice, isn't it? The, the punishment fitting the crime, the, 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 the purity and holiness, burning holiness of God, aroused by human sin. If we say we want justice, we're saying, we, we don't want you to be merciful towards us or to be compassionate. We want justice. Now, I want to illustrate this. Mike spotted it earlier with this. Because I don't know how you're doing. You may, be, you may think, oh, yeah, no, we see what you're saying, and, yeah, that makes sense. Or you may be thinking, no, it still doesn't seem just and right. So, Sarah. Let's just, just establish some things that are important at the start with, isn't it? This chocolate is mine. Okay? <laughs> This chocolate was Wayman's until about 10 past 10 this morning, but it is now mine. It was a slightly inflated price, but it is now mine. I've, I've bought it. It belongs to me. And I now can do really whatever I choose, can I? Because it, it's mine. I've paid for it. It belongs to me. I can do with it whatever I would like to do with it. I could, you know, and convince you it's a sermon illustration. I could eat it now one square at a time all the way through. I don't know if I could actually, but I could, I could, it would be, it wouldn't, it would, wouldn't be wrong of me to do that. Now I could give this to Sarah. <laughs> now if I chose to do that, which of course I'm in mean completely in my right suit, this is my chocolate, so if I decide to give it to Sarah, then that's absolutely right, isn't it? Now if Marilyn were to say, no, no, hang on a minute, where's my chocolate? The fact of the matter is, this belongs to me, doesn't it? I am free to choose to whatever I would like to do with it. And if I should choose to give this chocolate to Sarah, it doesn't somehow imply that Marilyn should also have a, a bar of chocolate. The, the, can you see that? It's not implied at all. She may think some of that, but that's not justice. This, this is mine. I'm free to do with this as I choose. And by giving a gift there, it doesn't somehow imply that I've been unjust and that I, sh I have to give it here. Now, if Sarah, two weeks ago, had turned up and I'd said at quarter to ten, is there any way we could actually sing this song to her? Just I've realised it really fits in with what we're doing. Would it be possible? And she says, OK, OK, I'll practice it, you know, and does that. Now, if I'm giving this gift as a response to a favour that Sarah's done... Then at that point, Marilyn and Pierre could say, well, hang on, three weeks ago, <laughs> didn't you mention this and we did this? So suddenly, we've now got human effort and, and, and reward and all of that sort of thing in play. And for me to reward one but not reward another, there is suddenly something unjust about that. The thing is... This initially is not an issue of justice. This is an issue of, of compassion, of kindness that I choose to bestow. In fact, I'll, let's, there you go. There you go. It, I, I, I didn't make that up. I heard that many years ago, and it actually helped me to realise when we're in that position of verse 14, things that, hang on, God is being unjust. In, in choosing and calling, I, there's something wrong in my understanding of things there. We do need to get our understanding sort of the right way round. You know, neither Jacob or Esau dis deserved anything from God. The Israel within Israel had done nothing to deserve anything from God. Paul's response, when he sees what's going on, is he desperately feels for his people. We saw that at the beginning of chapter 9. He, Paul just wants his people to hear the gospel. 
He, he says, didn't he, I wish I could be cut off and, and my people saved. Every new place Paul went to, he went to the synagogue first. He, he, wanted, he just wanted to get the gospel to people. He was impassioned for them. He loved them. He wanted to get the good news out. That's a camera angle that's important. But Paul's in no doubt that there is no human being that deserves God's compassion or mercy or forgiveness or for Jesus to die. None of us deserve it. But God, in his mercy and compassion, as he looked upon those sinful Israelites with the golden calf, was moved of his own being and his own mind to be merciful and compassionate. And so the sort of response, actually, when you think about God choosing and calling and what he's done for us, is not a matter of, oh, God's not very fair. It's more a matter of, you know, what mercy, what compassion. Why would God bestow his love upon me? Now, just finally, Paul drops in the example of Pharaoh to sort of underline the point he's making in verse 17. He says, for scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Pharaoh's heart, when you look in the book of Exodus, there's a lot of hardening going on in Pharaoh's heart, the, the, the sort of leader of the, the Egyptian people. Sometimes the Bible says, and these three camera angles, sometimes the Bible says that Pharaoh's heart was, was hardening, like as if his heart was doing it and hardening itself. Sometimes it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And sometimes it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's given as an example here of somebody that God has left in their sin. He's hardened his heart. He's hardened his already hardened heart. God is at work. God has made a choice when it comes to Pharaoh. God has allowed Pharaoh to become the most powerful ruler in the world, ruling the greatest nation, as it were, in the world at that time. And then God has humbled Pharaoh, the one who's mistreated his people so terribly. God has then displayed his power in, in an awesome way, rescuing the people of Israel out through the Red Sea and so on, bringing down Pharaoh and in the process, bringing glory to God's name. And verse 18 sums this whole thing up. God therefore has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. What we're confronted with here is a God that we cannot box and fashion and say, well, we think you should be a bit like this. We're confronted with the God who created the universe who acts in line with his good intentions and wills, who has purposes and plans and calls and chooses and raises up and hardens and acts as the great sovereign king that he is. But the big question and answer from this morning is, is God unjust to be like that? And Paul said, not at all. For we all deserve simply his judgment and his wrath. But he chooses to act in kindness and mercy and compassion. And just the last thought before I finish. It's not that God isn't just in Jacob's experience and Abraham's experience and in the lives of the people in the circle on the screen or in the experience of the Christian. It's not that God thinks I'll be merciful to Jacques and Nicola and I, I won't be just. No, the justice is on the cross. The payment for sin is on the cross. God himself absorbs his own wrath in order to be able to be merciful and compassionate. So it's not like he's saying that for these people their sin matters and for these people their sin doesn't matter. No, his justice falls on Jesus, which then frees his mercy for his people. Now, please do come and, and chat over coffee. I think we, we, it's, it's good to talk um, over coffee about some of the things that have come up in the service. You may, you may have questions. You may be delighted. You may be like the person on camp, overwhelmed by God's mercy and compassion to you, and that's wonderful. You may st still feel a bit cross and not sure, and that's fine. Come and talk um, about that as well. Um, interestingly, just for those of you that, that like... Um, these things. Just glance at verse 19, which is the next verse. 
Paul then says, on the basis of what he's just explained to us and that we've been thinking about, Paul then says, verse 19, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? If before the twins were born or done any good or bad, God had made a decision, why does God then blame us? So Paul doesn't shirk the big questions. That's next week. <laughs> so do pray um, before then.